forever. So yeah, lost them sleeping. That was good. Do you more centrally located so that because you're more, more central to this? Are you trying to put <laughs> put yourself in a corner to get now? Escape route. Okay. No. No, it was slowly just. Away. I was no, just. I'm trying to, I'm trying to give. I was trying to include to everybody. Hmm? Uh, I was trying to include everybody, and then sit on no, the other side. No, I get that. I'm just trying to, you know, make yeah. sure that the people who did things have the are noted as. Okay, think so. We're all in this together. <laughs> um, I don't even know if these are. Extra small over there, and they don't even serve them. Oh. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Alex, did we have to turn these on? They should be on. They should be on okay. Well, okay. If they're not on, they probably should be on, I guess, because that's what the mic is on. I just <laughs> plugged it into me. If it's not on, then it's like sure. attached it's if, it's, if it's all coming out. Good. <laughs> well, I mean, like, I just, we don't even have a sidewalk yet, so, like, I don't know if Fair the enough. kids are coming our way. I just hide in the basement. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to hide uh, and mark. There you, you know, go. It sounds lame, because I do love Halloween, but, like, I just, like, oh, I, I'm not so bad at, like, pretending I do. You know what I mean? But I'm like, oh, look at your talk. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, here. I don't know. I'm bad. I wonder what Biscuit would think of all the activity. Yeah, I would have to like fence him away. We already do kind of from the front door. So. So yeah, we only put a few, uh, really low light in our house, so no pumpkins, no nothing, and so people don't <laughs> usually come. Like a few brave people will come, but not a lot. Okay, perfect. Thanks, Alex. Alex, do you want to give <coughs> us a signal whenever we should start? <laughs> what did you get? Did you get that yesterday? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Jeez, that's a long uh, turnaround to today, right? Into mm -hmm. <laughs> and then tomorrow, yeah. Not tomorrow, actually. We get a bit of a <laughs> she's doing it Tuesday. Oh. She was supposed to be on Tuesday, oh, but they okay. were so come to the front and look at the cool shirt of the uh, woman who's sitting next to the window. That's really good. I, I, I'm really glad that you're going to be here doing it. Like, yeah. So I can live vicariously through your experience. <laughs> it, it's like... It's going to be really good. It's going to be a great opportunity to just like literally spend the day with her. So. Yeah. And we got an interview for FPS out of her for Wednesday morning. <laughs> Are you, did you have a chance to meet with Tiel and talk with her? No, actually, I didn't. So does my hair look had, perfect? Because they right. had, you guys had like two meetings well, that one day, and they didn't realize it. That's kind of perfect. Yeah. yeah. So like, it's ridiculous. Like I'm a busy guy. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. To Nick You're running the game. So that's said that they're going to set up a Discord channel with her, me, and Nissan. To just like go over like refake application stuff. Yeah. So they're gonna look at my application and like basically help roll you up into their catamari yeah. of it, <laughs> which is really good. Yeah, that's, that's um. gonna be really good. But yeah, so I figured, you know, let's let me do it. Yeah. Because I did sort of talk to her. About well, she knows who you are. She's good. She's gonna roll you in. Yeah, so absolutely. This is good. One minute, I'm told. Okay. Uh, and if it works like through rig refig, then like the new applications, you have to apply under a grads person at your institution. So you apply under me, but it would be once it goes through me, then it would be Nick or TL probably TL doing the actual mentor on the content. But yeah, the, I was wondering about that. Yeah, yeah, because we had talked about that yesterday morning in our meeting about how like how that would work. Mm, okay. Yeah. Am I up last? Uh, you are up last. In the intro, yeah. Does that make sense? Yes. Seems right. entirely appropriate. We're good. All right. Good morning. Happy Halloween, everybody. Uh, thank you for all coming. You guys are all chipper here. Way more chipper than maybe we might be this morning. Uh, but today is uh, Digital Media Literacy Week. 
uh, that runs from October 31st to November 4th. And so at the Games Institute, we figured that uh, we would put on um, a panel uh, partly in partnership with Media Smarts uh, to talk about the relationship between games and digital media literacy and the role of games and play in the 21st century, uh, particularly in terms of developing our critical thinking uh, and our digital literacy skills. So uh, what we're going to do is I'm going to introduce each of the panelists. They each have a quick uh, a quick uh, brief uh, talk and then we'll have some questions for them and open it up to the audience. Um, so I would like to start with Alex Orlando. She's a PhD candidate in the Department of English. She writes and does research on esports and gender. She's also the editor-in-chief of First Person Scholar. And First Person Scholar is a web-based publication and it seeks to foster uh, and promote the study, criticism, and literacy surrounding games and culture. She's also a Twitch streamer, and you can find her stream at Alexandra Live on Twitch. Um, I'd also like to introduce uh, Dr. Steve Wilcox. Steve's an instructor in game design and development program at Wilfrid Laurier, uh, and he's developed numerous serious and purposeful games in the area of health, wellness, professional training, um, and in uh, cultural communications. Uh, to my right is Dr. Neil Randall, and Neil's the director of the Games Institute, uh, which the Games Institute, where we are now, is a multidisciplinary research center at the University of Waterloo. Neil is an associate prof in the Department of English, and he works in fields such as the design of historical simulation games, the study of game adaptations of art artistic works, especially Tolkien's works, uh, and the study and implementation of purposeful games. And myself, I'm uh, Dr. Jen Whitson, I'm a sociologist, and I study the secret life of software, the people who make it, and how that software changes our everyday lives. Uh, so currently I work with, uh, on a few projects with independent developers looking at how they sustain their creative work, uh, and also the surveillance implications of games and playful devices like our Fitbits, uh, which gather and transmit uh, our deepest, darkest secrets, like how little we actually exercise. Um, and so without further ado, I would like to open up the panel to Dr. Wilcox. Thanks, Jen. I gotta work on my, my pitch, The Secret Life of Software. That's a great, yeah. that sells it right there. I gotta work on mine. Yeah, um, you win, yeah, no yeah. question. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Game over, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so I wanted to kick things off by talking just kind of generally about gaming and literacy and where those two meet and how that uh, uh, can help us moving forward and understand the relationship between games and, and learning and pedagogy and really our, our, our lives in the 21st century as well. So this notion of, of games and gaming literacy actually comes up quite often in the study of games, um, most recently from uh, Eric Zimmerman and Heather Chaplin. Um, they wrote this manifesto uh, in which they predict that the next 100 years will be defined as the age of play or the ludic century. And uh, part of the reason why they're making that argument is that um, they're seeing, we're seeing uh, the rise of games as cultural um, artifacts. And at the same time, we're seeing ourselves becoming more increasingly globalized, interconnected, and uh, situated in all these different systems, um, um, systems that are made up of laws and rules and policies and cultural systems as well. And as we become more interconnected, it becomes more and more important for us to understand how these systems operate. Our our positions within them, how they shape our outlooks and our perspectives, and how they shape the outlooks and perspectives of other people. And that sort of intercultural communication is going to be really vital as we go into the 21st century. And games have a really pivotal role to play in helping us become more intercultural and more informed citizens of the world. Uh, and so we can begin by, by somewhat defining this idea of gaming literacy as uh, understanding how systems shape um, people, places, and ideas. So to give you an example of that, just a kind of run-of-the-mill example that you might have already be familiar with, uh, a particular game called Monopoly. Um, so that is a pretty clear example of a game that represents a, a particular system, in this case an economic system. Um, and with Monopoly, you know, no matter what values or beliefs you have going into that game, by the end of it, you're going to, um, by the time you, f you finish playing your first game of it, you're going to have a better understanding of the, the rules and the values and the beliefs that that game kind of encodes and attempts to persuade you of. Um, and that really gestures towards this, this uh, 
role that games play in our lives in that they represent different systems of, of all kinds. Um, and they do that through their rules. And one of the interesting things about rules is that they capture both what is possible and what is probable within any given system. So for Monopoly, um, there are a number of different possible moves you can make within that, the rules of the game. But the one rule about which defines how you win the game also dictates what the most probable move is th that you're going to make in any given situation, which is one that kind of leads you to being the most, most ruthless and most successful kind of capitalist and landowner in this situation. So we can see how, how the, the rules can kind of quickly encapsulate both, both those aspects of possibilities and probabilities in given systems. And for that reason, they're really quite effective tools for communicating uh, ideas that are kind of shaped by these things that we don't necessarily directly perceive but necessarily um, give form to our ideas and beliefs and values. Um, this is Monopoly is an interesting case study for game historians because it was actually originally based on a criticism of um, monopolist land ownership. It came from the game called the Landowners Game, and it was meant to be a, a, a kind of thorough critique of this idea that um, land ownership belongs to wealthy individuals to then um, kind of use to exploit um, less wealthy individuals and to kind of consolidate and maintain their power. Um, the original game had two versions to it and one of them was the monopolist mode which was supposed to be kind of send up of this, of this uh, distribution of land and um, how it actually leads to the exploitation of individuals and really the decay of the community. Um, but when you play the two modes against one another, invariably the monopolist mode was more fun, it was more engaging. People kind of derived a sense of pleasure out of exploiting their fellow players. Um, but what a game like Monopoly can kind of teach us is that what, does that, what does that say about our own current economic system? Maybe there's already a sense of pleasure that's being derived by those that are in a position to, to act as monopolists within our current um, economic system as well. And Monopoly itself, it, it gestures towards other types of games, other possibilities for games as we move forward into the ludic century. Um, so we know that from games like Monopoly that games can and often do function um, as adaptations of social, cultural, and historical rules. Um, they teach players what is possible and probable under particular laws, um, policies, and uh, procedures. So for instance, uh, most more recently, um, the BBC put together uh, a game called Syrian Journey. And what they wanted to do was communicate to their readership the experiences that Syrians face when they were trying to emigrate out of the country of Syria. But rather than doing a kind of long form journalistic piece that would have been a series of interviews, they actually they sat down with people that had emigrated from Syria, um, gathered information on their experiences, aggregated that into a, a particular game system, and then had their readership play through that system and encounter similar choices and have to make similar decisions as those people that were immigrating. The point being that to, to um, encourage people to think through the kind of practical reality that people faced and the, the different social and cultural and uh, procedural rules that Syrians have to face as they try to leave uh, a conflict zone and find a place of safety and familiarity, or a pla place of safety and, and comfort for their families as well. Um, another game that kind of fits within this um, system of trying to represent how rules impact our everyday lives is one that's currently in development now at Concordia uh, called The Oldest Game which attempts to show how the uh, effects of Bill C-36, um, which was then passed uh, more recently, uh, which has to do with sex workers, and how that, that law kind of criminalizes and penalizes particular people within that system that, um, that wouldn't, uh, that in, a, in, a, in a kind of unnecessarily punitive kind of way. Uh, and then what, this, what these types of games show is how um, gameplay captures how knowledge is shaped um, by uh, distinct situations and distinct perspectives within various situations and the different rules in which we find ourselves, the social and cultural rules in which we find ourselves embedded. Um, and that really gestures towards this fact that moving ahead, gaming literacy is really going to be a, a way of translating knowledges between situations and across places. So as we become increasingly globalized, increasingly interconnected and related to one another through different systems, uh, gaming literacy is our really is going to be our, our our means of developing compassionate and informed understanding of one another and understanding um, not just in abstractions but in kind of practical realistic terms of the different situations that other people face and the knowledges that they produce of those situations. Thanks. Cool. All right, Alex, let's have a 
Thanks, Steve. That was, um, I think that shaped a lot of the theoretical fr framework for this whole panel, and that was really interesting and slightly comedic, um, <laughs> as, as most things should be. Uh, so I'm, I'm Alex. I'm the editor-in-chief of First Person Scholar, and First Person Scholar is a middle state publication. And what we mean by that is a publication that bridges the gap between um, high concept academic work and gaming journalism. And we meet in the middle, hence middle state, uh, to try and make informed game criticism that is accessible to everyone. When we are talking about academic work, oftentimes this work is hidden behind a paywall. We need library access that is often at the co high cost or you, know, you have to be a student. Um, and then on the other end, gaming journalism often just barely scratches the surface of what we can talk about in terms of game criticism. So First Person Scholar, as well as other middle state publications, help to you know, think a little bit more critically about what we're playing and how we're playing. We publish traditional essays, although I would argue they're not necessarily even most traditional, uh, commentaries, which is often based on a play experience, and book reviews of game studies books. So we offer a wide variety of uh, different ins to gaming criticism. More recently, we've um, published video essays. So on the left is our first video essay. It is really excellent and I think challenges the way that we can even make research more accessible. And we also do podcasts. So we do a monthly podcast where the editors and I sit down, we discuss a topic, we just um, recorded our kind of Halloween episode on horror games and indie horror, and um, taking a more casual conversational tone to how we kind of criticize games and uh, kind of encapsulate even the things we talk about in this office, and like, why shouldn't we record this? So we did. And they are really effective, I think, at um, just humanizing the game critic a little bit more. Uh, you know, we're not all scary professors, um, and and we, you know, we've got some personality to us that probably doesn't come around in a traditional academic essay. Uh, so I think that first person scholar is really successful in um, emphasizing that really any of us can do games criticism. You can, um, as I kind of linked here to the left, the right is our one of our recent uh, pieces where a person who is vegetarian looks at food in games and how they connect with that, um, you know, being that a lot of food in games is meat-based or, or very surface level, uh, you know, you eat the food to get HP, uh, and, and looking a little bit more deeper into how food functions in games, which is um, backed on this personal experience that they have with food in their daily lives. So that's the kind of stuff we like to publish uh, alongside, you know, excellent essays that we have as well as book reviews. So uh, First Person Scholar really takes a role in mobilizing research in ways that uh, traditional academic publishing or journalism doesn't. I personally do this on my stream, as Jen mentioned, where I live stream game, <laughs> game commentary. And we also want to see more stuff like that, where you're connecting with your audience in a more meaningful way than you may see on a traditional Twitch stream where you know, it's all comedy or all pure game mechanics. So that kind of stuff is fresh. We're playing with it still, but the formula seems to be working with our audience. Um, so I guess that's all I had to say. Great. Without further ado, Neil. Oh, am I next? You are. <coughs> I thought I was last. You are. Oh, this is last. OK. <laughs> <coughs> so I, I just thought there were four, and I'm third. So I never know. We can get there. Uh, anyway, I'm the director of the Games Institute, and, and I think what, what, what Steve and Ali both pointed out is kind of a fundamental philosophy under which I work, that we never stop playing games, ever. And I was actually uh, looking at my, what I was doing in the car in the last few days. I don't do anything bad in the car, I drive, so don't worry about that. But even this morning, I made sure, because this is what I do, and I never use GPSs because they're no fun, but I make sure that I avoid lineups on the road. And I will do anything to make that happen, practically anything. And a lot of what I do is 
play with the navigation system in my head. Because the other thing that's always fun for me is to get off a road that I know and find out where I'm, where, and realize I don't know where I am, and then find my way back. I look at this as gameplay. This is what we do in games all the time. We explore, we navigate. We navigate unknown system, right? I have a goal to avoid the lineup. If it takes me longer, that doesn't bother me. Just avoiding the lineup is important. But the other thing I try to do on the weekend, because I do this when I'm out driving with my wife, is I try to get lost. And I maintain that you can't get lost in southern Ontario. You just can't do it. But I keep working at that, because what I'm trying to do is, is, is modify the rules of what I do all the time. I was uh, giving a talk last Wednesday, and, I, and we started talking about insurance as a game, which is a really fascinating one, because really what insurance is is gambling and hoping you lose. That's what it is, right? Because we buy life insurance hoping we never have to use it. We will eventually, but then you make that happen. And anything that you actually do a cost-benefit analysis of in your life is actually game playing. And, and insurance is just one of them. I don't know if you go, you have to tick off in the insurance box, I want this coverage rather than this coverage. And you're always trying to figure out which is the level I want to go to, because it's going to cost me more, I might gain more. I really hope I never have to use it. Anyway. So a lot of what, what you know, Steve was talking about, these are games for purposes, purposeful games, games for special purposes, is trying to reflect the fact that everything we do is gameplay. So old ideas about, not old ideas, current ideas and old ideas about play and play theory, that play is, in a, in a cert, to a certain sense, divorced from the real world, the consequence of the real world, is something I've simply never found. Uh, Steve mentioned, for instance, that we look at uh, gaming literacy as a way of understanding systems, as a way of understanding research and all sorts of things as we move forward. I think it's a very important consideration. It's certainly something I've done throughout my life. Anyway, the, game, the, the, games, the, the Games Institute is fully multidisciplinary. We have people here from engineering, from computer science, from humanities, from social sciences, from health sciences. Um, and we, the whole purpose is to bring people together and start talking about all the ramifications of games. And this fits entirely into the games literacy idea. How does it impact everything from entertainment to health to education to science to all sorts of things? And we can, there's lots of examples we can point to um, when welcome here today. Okay, great. I have some provocative questions, I think, because uh, you guys seem to get along a little bit too much <laughs> here. Uh, so. I see two different modes of digital literacy, right? Um, on Steve and Neil's side, they're saying that we can use games and system-based thinking to teach uh, really high-end concepts, right? Uh, that games as an argument and a procedure or rhetoric is a way to teach um, more effectively, perhaps, than article sort of formats. Whereas Alex, with first-person scholar, she's saying like, no, 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 no. We don't need to go specifically to serious games. We can just talk about the games that we play every day, uh, the games that we love, uh, and then that, that will help us uh, sort of broadcast knowledge and writing about it by using games as a foci, right? And making games, using games as a foci in first-person scholar to make literacy more accessible um, and outside of sort of game studies journal. Um, so sort of my first sort of question is how much of a game do you need to play to actually comment on it in any sort of meaningful form? I find that um, it's really tough to get a full commentary on a game unless you've played the whole thing. Uh, now I recognize that Sometimes that's actually not the case, but you have to kind of put a caveat in front of it. So I think one of the things Steve and I talked about a lot, and maybe we're, again, we're like not pitting each other against uh, uh, the question as much as we'd like, but when we were talking about the marketing for Deus Ex Mankind Divided, and we're both huge Deus Ex fans. We do a video series on the original, um, which is um, really breaking that down. But when the marketing came out for Mankind Divided, so the game's not even out yet, and they start um, flinging words around like mechanical apartheid or Ogs Lives Matter, you know, there's think pieces coming out of that like crazy. And that's valid criticism, but to an extent, because we didn't know at the time how it played out in the game. 
So I think it's important to get that message out there and express like the concern because it was ultimately a concern purely for the I think the marketing strategy of that game, which is very much still a part of the game's ethos in the world. But it isn't until you play the full game that you can see how it does or does not incorporate that kind of message. So, you know, it's it's really tough to talk about the game in full if you haven't played the game in full. But there are moments, I think, small moments within the game that don't require a full examination of the entire playthrough. Yeah, like this comes up quite often when you're trying to teach games and, and you don't have 40 hours to, to <laughs> your students don't have 40 hours to play through uh, like a game of like a like Mankind Divided or like a Skyrim or something like that. So you often have to pick a subset of it or um, have them play kind of more smaller web-based type games to get them familiar with how those mechanics work. But um, I think you need to play enough of a game to understand how those, like I said, how those rules shape what you think is possible and probable within that system, which is a very analytical approach, but it's also one that I think um, is part of the, the value, the pedagogical value of, of games as, as heuristics for teaching us how to think about the world. Um, one game I have my students playing this week um, is called Brothers, A Tale of Two Sons. Um, and I'm, my class is an interactivity course. And this game, heads up for spoilers, um, you need to get to the end of it to really get everything that's meant to, to be got out of that game. And that's because how the game works is you play your controller and each joystick controls a, one of the brothers. And there's two brothers and you solve puzzles together by getting them to do different things. But at the end of the game, one of your brothers passes away. And the, the joystick that normally controlled him, when you press it, causes the other brother to start sobbing. Because it's a kind of phantom limb type relationship where the, the mapping of pressing that joystick is like triggering a memory for him. And it just causes him to, to stop and kind of reflect on that moment. And you don't really get that if you're only going to play the first 10, 15 minutes of that game. Um, sometimes, it's in, in this case, it's kind of about respecting the, the game designer and having faith that they're taking you somewhere memorable and meaningful. Um, and in this case, I think that they really captured that, but you need to spend those, I think it's only a three or four hour game, but you need to spend those three hours developing that muscle memory of thinking about how you're controlling and adapting to these different situations with each of these two people to really get the full effect of what happens when that person is gone, and then to reflect on how that could relate to the character in the game world itself. So just to prompt a little bit more, you're a streamer, so a lot of uh, the people who watch your stream are just doing it as sort of a passive one-way media. Um, and you're making the argument that you actually have to play a game physically and learn the rules physically in order to take something away from it. Um, so can you develop a game's literacy if you're only watching Let's Plays and YouTube streams and, and walkthroughs? Because I assign a lot of games in class, but quite a few of people, we just don't have time to play, and so people are watching instead of playing. And so what may be lost um, when we're relying on, on that sort of mode, the passive mode of watching YouTubes? <coughs> I think that it depends on what you're talking about specifically. Uh, there's a huge area of game studies that talks about representation, either gender, race, sexuality, that the mechanics of the game don't really have anything to do with if we're talking about purely art design. Um, or visuals in the game. I think that, so for example, when I play Overwatch and I talk about um, cultural appropriation with some of the skins that are in the game and I say, hey look, Bear is Egyptian and she's wearing a uh, indigenous uh, sort of armor piece, you don't have to play the game to have a conversation about that at all. You can just look at that image and think, what is Blizzard doing here? What has been Blizzard doing in the past that is similar to this? And why is that a problem, or why isn't it? So for those kind of conversation that I have on my stream, it completely has nothing to do with the actual gameplay, and you can have a conversation about it. But you know, we're talking about something like Steve with Brothers. You have to play the game to understand what, that, like what the, feel, the emotions are of, of kind of losing that other half, and, and, and it's tied into it. But we have to remember that not every game, I think Brothers is an exception to that, um, not every game puts that much thought and creativity into their mechanics. So in some cases, 
I don't think we do need to play the game to make it at least some sort of argument or uh, commentary on the game. But I still think you're losing some of the experience. And what I mean by that is one of the, one of the interesting things that happens when you focus on the visuals and the sound of a game in a, in a Twitch stream, for instance, is that you're focused on the visuals and the sound. And it, the gameplay experience very often either circumvents that or basically denies it. This, is, this is, comes up in the discussion, which is, you know, germane to the gaming literacy, discussions about things like violence in games, right? Because when you're playing these things, often you don't even notice the actual images that are happening on the screen because you're too focused on other things. I spend a lot of games playing and I'm just focusing on either hit bars or you know circles that are happening over on the side. I don't see the graphics at all. So I think I agree with you, Alex, to some, to some extent, but I still think you're not actually commenting on the game. Mm -hmm. You're commenting on certain aspect of the game that may as well be a film, for that matter. So I, I will argue with you on that one. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think that there are multiple maybe levels of literacy and one is sort of the, the systems and sort of the haptic literacy and what are what is the game rewarding, what is the game not rewarding in terms of the mechanics versus sort of maybe a more like traditional textual literacy and what is the game resent representing and what are the values that are espoused in the narrative of the game and not only actually in the rules. Um, so my sort of next question is, we hear a lot about, you know, welcome to the ludic century. Most of the ways that we interact with the world is, is via digitally, uh, and that we should be able to learn how to make games, right? As part of digital literacy is not only to read games as solid text, but actually to have some sort of mastery and understanding the deep level systems sort of things. Um, so do you agree or not agree? Should learning to code or at least game making tools be part of sort of game studies curriculum or even faculty of arts, humanities curriculum? Yeah, I, I definitely, um, I'll take that one up. I think that, but only not because necessarily that because we, we need to become, well, we only need to become game designers, but to kind of grab a page from your book, Neil, it's, it's more about that the world is already composed of these different systems. We all um, have different, depending on our, on our race and our gender and our backgrounds, we all have different social and cultural rules that we are, are supposed to conform to. And so um, those, those rules um, and understanding how they shape us is essentially thinking like a game designer. It's, it's evaluating how those, those constraints and affordances shape us and shape how we view one another and they shape what knowledge we're able to produce of the world. And so um, that's one part, and then becoming a game designer and engaging with those topics is another, because you can actually start to transcribe those social and cultural rules into the design of a game itself, and have people that aren't familiar with that experience on a personal level engage with them, and face those similar questions, encounter those similar decisions, and then better intuit what, um, how that shapes the beliefs and values of other people, and it, it makes us more receptive and more open. I think it's really part of um, our role as being engaged citizens moving forward is being able to think through these systems, especially when we look at the legal part of our, of our society as being a, a large system that's supposed to treat everyone basically the same, but that's the ideal. In principle, we know that that's not the case. And understanding how that broad system actually impacts us differently, th that's crucial to, to developing more, more just and more, um, more reasonable and up upstanding societies and cultures as well. So, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> um, my question is whether <laughs> you need to develop some sort of code literacy in order to have a digital media games <laughs> literacy, right? I almost Do we that. all <laughs> need to become game makers? Uh, and, and you're saying yes. Yeah, clearly. but I almost would almost flip it in the fact that I think that we're already, we're already in a sense game players explicitly or implicitly, and it's time that we kind of take ownership of that and get more participatory in how we, how we shape those systems and what say we have over them and, and under better understanding who they impact. Um, and whether that's coding, whether that's board game design, or whether that's something more like um, what Nikki Case calls explorable explanations. So like web pages that, that um, are interactive and take a very s small idea and allow you to play around with it to get a better understanding of that. Even if it's, if it's just that, that kind of level of interaction is being able to 
produce that and interpret it is going to, I think, be crucial in becoming um, more engaged as we move forward. I, I wonder if there's a parallel to uh, video, uh, film, if you will, in this, in, this, in this way that, I mean, I was about to ask the question because you're you saying we should learn how to design these things and, and understand the system. And then I said, well, would you say the same thing about studying film? Because most of us don't make big budget movies. But on the other hand, what's happened over the last, you know, five, ten years, of course, with the rise of YouTube and other video systems is that, in fact, we all have all become filmmakers. So I wonder if it's just taken that long to bridge the gap. But that also points to, the, of course, the development of tools and all sorts of things to make game design and game development much more practical for a whole bunch of us who don't want to dig into code, right? So, yeah. Yeah, yeah and I would argue that, like, we are 100% not there yet with games. Uh, and the problem with us, like, saying, yes, let's all make games is that it's very, it's a very idealistic, utopian kind of view of, you know, we're all playing with the systems that we live in. But we have to remember that not everyone has access to that sort of information or learning, especially in the arts, right? We, it would be amazing if we had a course where we could um, learn how to play around with, with code or software like that. But the reality is, is that um, we don't, and oftentimes the uh, kind of avenues for learning are hostile to not only women, but people of color, color and other minorities. And so you're, it's a big ask for someone to kind of jump into this environment and uh, kind of integrate into that world that's uh, not the most welcoming and friendly. And we are seeing some groups like Dames Making Games in Toronto, which sort of um, create a more safe and welcoming environment for women. But that's not available to everyone. That's not everywhere. Even, even to say, oh, everyone, let's go to Toronto from here is it could be a challenge. So uh, I think that I, I absolutely do not think everyone uh, should have to make games to completely criticize them. And, and we see as in with, with a lot of the articles on First Person Scholar, it's in fact a whole bunch of other subset of um, cultural experiences that are the things that are making games criticism uh, different from games journalism. Because in games journalism, we do get the very, the graphics are nice. Oh, it was really interesting how they did that with the, with the engine and blah, blah, blah. And how many times do we have to read that over and over again before it gets stale? So and although that's important, you know, it's, it's not the deep level of thinking that I think comes from a certain background of people that are marginalized within the community right now. And it's one of the reasons I mentioned the film idea. It's also in, in literary studies, no, nobody ever says, you have to learn. You have to write a novel in order to talk about one, mm. right? On the other hand, to counter slightly the 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 the, the, the tool, the skill set necessary to make game, everybody here remember that you can make board games for without knowing anything about code or anything like that. So, and that is certainly an, a way to get into it. Yeah. So, is there a difference between sort of the analog games literacy of what you learn from when you're making or playing a board game? versus digital media literacy that's related to playing an online game? Or is it the same thing, just a different spectrum and scale? I think really the analog game literacy is much more related to understanding rules and systems. I mean, there's no, well, I shouldn't say this. There are probably Twitch feeds about playing, you know, Scrabble, but almost nobody wants to watch a video feed with somebody playing a, a, a board game. It just doesn't happen because it's a completely different experience. But if you want to look into how games are made, they're great because you have to understand the rules before you can actually play the game. And so I think it's a very different kind of literacy. And I think the experience is vastly different as well, including the outcome. Because the outcome tends to be much more about the stories the players create for themselves in the sense that, think about a game of cards. At the end of a hand, you start talking about the hand and what your experience was in that whole situation, so it emerges that way, which is a little bit different because we don't have that, that strong movie-like component, the visuals and the, and the audio to, to go by. So it, it, it doesn't create that kind of visual um, masterpiece, if you will. Yeah, yeah and I, I guess um, most times you're starting out learning digital game design, you're gonna start with analog format because that's getting, like Neil said, the, the rules down and, and focusing on, on what kind of experience you want your players to have. Um, that's one of the other 
strong advantages of, of game design moving forward, both analog and digital, is that unlike most other forms of media, you're fully engaged with designing experiences. And in game design, you're compelled to recognize that there are different experiences and there are different types of players. You don't necessarily have to come to terms with that in, in print or in film, but you definitely do when, when you're doing game design. Um, and I think that um, that's something that's shared between both of them, both analog and digital. Yeah, and, and it's um, puts us puts game designers in a unique position where they need to understand vast parts of our culture that we've never really asked artists to understand before in terms of not just processes and procedures, but fundamental differences that exist between us that if you want those people playing your game, you need to anticipate them, you need to understand them, you need to incorporate them into your design practices either way. Um, I'm wondering one thing, um, and I'm thinking like we're talking about learning how to make games, learning how to code, using games and gameplay in our university classes, about taking scholarship outside of sort of these really long written texts and tomes and, and putting them on websites like First, First Person Scholar or, or sort of designing them into board games that we can all play. Um, is this a sign that education is failing us and we're moving away from sort of traditional modes of university instruction and education and, and knowledge dissemination? We're moving from textbook to video game? Or if and is, th is this a bad thing, right? That we're moving to sort of games-based literacy or a great thing? Or what are the pros and cons related with that? Well, I think you could say that universities and colleges have moved away from knowledge dissemination hundreds of years ago. When, when education became something that we separated from the community and isolated to campuses, that began the, the process of which those became the sites of knowledge and understanding and they became disconnected from the actual practical real world communities that they were supposed to really be inspired by and apply back to. And so in a sense I think that um, games and, and game-based learning really forces us to come back to that sense of community, that sense of, of engagement with people across campuses <coughs> and off campuses and ac across continents and across cultures. Um, and that's, that's their, their, their pedagogical value is, is kind of pulling us out of, off of campuses and, and compelling us to convey these ideas in ways that are intelligible and interpretable and something that people can grasp with and critique, but without having, having to spend years and years building up that, that knowledge base in order to even interpret a particular sentence or statement. I think one of the uh, failings, especially something that we're working on with First Person Scholar, is trying to connect what we do to industry. And one of the major roadblocks we have is that people in industry don't understand the value of what we as academics do with games. And that's a huge problem, right? We want to be able to use our work to help better improve the games that are being made in the AAA studios or the indie studios. So there's a disconnect between the industry and what ac the, the academy is doing. And the result is like when you're making an academic text you're, and you're sending it out, you know, there's a good chance that it's just going to end up being read by other academics who kind of either criticize or support, uh, but either way it becomes a sort of echo chamber. And we need to figure out how what we're doing here is actually informing what's out there. Uh, and we need to work on that. And we need to make sure that our work is actually being put to use and that we're not just sending a book out into the world and you spend years and years and years on that book and, and soon, you know, if no one sees the value in that, how much longer are we actually gonna be around for? What's, yeah. what, why is the government gonna you know, support what we're doing or give us funding um, to be able to stay afloat when there's nothing really, there's no change being enacted in the world. And then you compare that against like the work of like Anita, Sar Anita Sarkeesian, Tropes versus Women, which is that video series that looks at the portrayal of women in AAA games. And it has a, had a profound impact on game developers. They've changed, a number of people come out and said, I'm not doing these things anymore. I'm not gonna do motion capture that does these ridiculously exploitative poses. I'm not gonna animate my characters in this way. I'm gonna write better women into my story. I'm gonna, you know, this, my characters are gonna start passing the, the Vectel test. Like, it, there, there's been a, a, a massive outpouring, I think, from, from the development community in response to those accessible, intelligible, short videos 
which should give us um, cause to consider what has decades and decades of game studies done to, to extend its influence outside of the campus, to, to do similar um, work to, to demonstrate to people the problematic aspects of, of their artistic representations and to give them cause to consider adopting different practices themselves. That, that disconnect to me is really, it's inspiring because it's deeply uh, effective and, and it shows that developers are willing to listen. But I think to me it's, it's a call to academics to step up their game, to, to make more intelligible and accessible scholarship and to actually start bridging the divide rather than kind of just building up our own wealth without necessarily um, having any application for that, that knowledge. I'm the long-term academic here, so I may be able to comment on this. First of all, yes to what both of you said. The only thing I will say, I don't think it's an, it's an either-or idea. Um, certainly what we're doing here is trying some innovative approaches to getting the word out so it actually has impact. But the strength, if you will, of the academic system has always been in building expertise. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways to build expertise, as, 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 as much as I don't like it a lot, is that kind of a smaller and smaller list of experts that talk to each other and keep raising it in one another's game. There's all kinds of problems with that system, but it does mean that I think we need all of the above, and that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a tall order. So we need the kind of high level, most of the public isn't going to care about this kind of thinking, and we also need the, now well, how, what we can do about funneling that into, I won't say down, because that's not the word, but across into a larger public. Um, I don't think they're mutually exclusive, but I think we have to recognize there is a value in all of those. And we're, we're actually in a, in a very privileged area here because games speak to an enormous part of the population. In a lot of cases, a lot of the, the research that goes on doesn't. And we have to, so we're, we're able to, to take that and make some, ca some cases here that others don't. Certainly there's everything from gender studies, you know, sociology issues, Psychology issues have long been involved with reaching out to the larger public. Psychology particularly, because then you have the popular psychology idea, which you know, you know, some psychologists are just don't know what to do with because it's making such a huge impact on our life. So I think being in that position is really strong, but let's recognize there is still value in that long, critical discussion that, that you know, has formed the basis of a lot of disciplines. Mm -hmm. Okay, in the following sort of few minutes before the hour is up, uh, I would like to open it up to the audience. If anybody has a question, just uh, raise your hand and then I think Alex ha in the back has our microphone. Otherwise, uh, if I see no hands raised, I will keep poking and prodding with questions of my own. Does anybody have any comments, thoughts? Um, so I have a question just speaking more generally about uh, digital media literacy skills and at what age should we start teaching them and incorporating them into sort of children and kids' lives, right? Because there's always this debate about screen time and youth um, and that we should be taking youth away from the video <laughs> games and actually uh, putting limits on games and games-based learning. So how, how do you teach? Uh, games literacy to a young age, and is there a limit on how much you should sort of incorporate games into the education? Yeah, I, I think that's a difficult question, but it's it's one where um, games often get lumped together as as a kind of single entity. And so I think it's important to make a distinction between different types of games, different kinds of games, and which ones you're introducing at particular ages are going to depend on what type of game that is and, and how applicable it is to that given part of their, their, their development. But I think that, you know, we look at the, like the UK government giving out Raspberry Pis to all of the um, children going through the edu education system there, um, New York State kind of imposing um, rules about learning to code as part of your, your education as well. Um, at, and those moves come from um, a desire to simply prepare people for the economy that's forthcoming, which is going to ask of them particular skills and um, we can say those are coding skills or we can say they're, they're um, um, te technical skills but I, I'd like to think that they're more design skills and, and, and um, system thinking skills because those are the types of, of, of ideas we're going to need in order to deal with highly globalized problems and issues like conflicts and resource scarcity and climate change. Those are not things that are easily solved in, in kind of static models of representation. We need more dynamic ones and so 
as soon as we can introduce games and, and the appropriate games, I, I think is the best time because we're going to need those people to come up with solutions and, and uh, ways of engaging people across the globe and, and addressing some fairly imminent and, and um, dangerous issues that we're facing. I think there's a value to, um, you know, we have to remember the type of gameplay that's not, has, that has nothing to do with the screen. And I think it's important mm -hmm. to kind of a balance of both of those two. We think of um, things like the Reggio Emilia approach, which is a system for childcare where, you know, you give the children natural materials, you know, working with wood and getting them dirty and just, you know, getting them out there in the world. And there's a value to learning and experiencing the world that way. But at the same time, we need to be introducing technology, I think, in a kind of educational environment much earlier than we are right now, especially if we think about the ways in which some people get left behind in that process. You know, computer science, I don't think, should be optional in high school. I think that everyone should have some sort of class like that, and, you know, then maybe we won't see the gender divide, for example, that we do later on when people start to say, oh, you, you could have made a game. Oh, I would have liked to have been told that actually when I was in elementary school, you know? You can make games. Here's where you can get started. You know, it's up to you and, and not having to negotiate, say, the career I have now, which is not based around games and trying to, you know, you know, thinking, oh, I should maybe learn how to code now when I've already got like 10 other things going on that I've already been working on. So I think it's so important just for, for just telling children that you can do it. And here's some materials that you can use because you know, you're not going to necessarily get mommy and dad buying you the Raspberry Pi when you're, you know, however old, uh, and, and making it a normal part of, of society and a, and a career option for, for all children. Well, and to tie that back to, to literacy, you know, how much <coughs> do you need to know about programming and um, product design in order to understand your privacy rights? Um, and how, how your, your the default password on your router works? And if you're, you know, we just had a, a case come up um, yesterday, the day before, in which an 85-year-old woman was charged with illegally pirating uh, a zombie horror game, um, and she <laughs> um, she can't even play it on her laptop, but she's still been charged with illegally downloading that because someone was hop probably hopped on her Wi-Fi connection and pirated it through there. Um, and 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 how how well sh we understand how those systems work, and actually the the laws that relate to whether that's a um, uh, whether um, businesses are able to send these kind of intimidation tactics. So it wasn't actually, she wasn't charged, it was a, a company um, litigating on behalf of, of the publisher and saying you owe us 5000 upwards of $5,000. And it's this was just a new law that was passed last year that allows them to do this, to kind of harangue people whether they're guilty or not. And understanding how those technologies work, how those networks work, it could be crucial in, in defending your own rights and the rights of others in society as we move forward. So there's going to be a, a knock-on effect too as we where we're going to be kind of compelled to, to adopt these types of literacies to really to uphold our own rights, I think, and protect them. Well, the yeah. Oh, yeah, I was, I was just going to hold on a second. Hold on a second so the live stream can pick you up. Okay. All right. So um, I guess I just have, uh, have uh, a comment or two. I mean, I, I have kids. I'm getting a PhD in computer science. Um, I'm a bit deeply suspicious of this idea that all we need to do is put more technology in schools and that will make things better. Mm -hmm. I don't think it ever works that way. No. I've never seen it work that way. Uh, my kids pick up games easily enough, thank you very much. Uh, sometimes it's, it's, it's trouble getting them to stop. And um, I, I can kind of see that they're learning a bit about this, uh, you know, this kind of systemic thinking, I guess, like if I do this, then this other thing happens, and if I do that, and this other thing happens, and it's great fun, and that's, that's, that's the way we do it. I, I, I don't know, I kind of think that in, when it comes to a lot of these technology things, the schools are not the leading edge, they're the trailing edge. Like, they're, they're just picking up these things after everybody else has already moved. So I don't know if you have a, <laughs> any comments on that. Well, I think that that's an issue with what we're using schools for. And that's a long time change that we, we, we have to implement. And the fact that you're absolutely right, throwing technology into the classroom is no answer to anything, right? Because somebody has to figure out how, how this is supposed to be taught 
and what it's good for. And we're really talking about media literacy here. When you talk about everything from screen time, whether it's understanding how to code, understanding how to, you know, systems that go on with the game, this is media literacy. And are, are, are teachers trained to do this? Obviously not, because they're coming from an earlier generation that didn't have these things, a lot of them, right, in many cases. So that's part of a longer systemic issue that has to do with, yeah, if we want, if we want people to be familiar with, I don't know if coding is what it is, but whatever it happens to be, then we got a bunch of problems. Where do you start? How do you start? How do you train people to do it? In the same, and, but if you look at it another way, one of the technologies we've been using in schools for a very long time is writing, right? And it's successful because a lot of people know how to do it. They know how to teach it. And so looking at it the same way, in a hundred years, this might be solved, but it's not going to be solved immediately. But I get the, I get the point you're making. I mean, the same way we have to teach people how to watch television. Are we doing it properly? It's a huge part of people's lives. I'm not sure we actually teach that kind of media literacy well either. We tend to say, well, don't do it. Don't do it as much. Is that the answer? Probably not. So anyway, that's, that's part of that. And I don't know, I'm, I'm, I'm a McLuhanist. <laughs> and he was a pretty vocal critic of education because the speed at which technology was changing, even in the 60s and 70s, far outpaced what um, the school systems were able to keep up with. And so we had this idea of um, what he called the classroom without walls. So just treating the city the um, province, the country, as your classroom, and that's that's where you go to find information. That's where you go to learn, and and not um, sectioning students off from that world and trying to teach them in these kind of arbitrary environments, but taking them out into the world and immersing them in the the, the world that they're going to face when they do leave that classroom and encountering it, and that that kind of practical reality um, aspect of it. And I don't I don't want to sit up here and and be like a, an evangelist for games. I don't think that they're um, the cure-all for, for what ails society. Um, throughout the past decades, we've seen a number of technologies emerge that were supposed to revolutionize education, like cable television. I don't, <laughs> I didn't watch a lot of cable television in my, my um, time in school. It, it just didn't pan out. But I, I do think that um, games are in a, in a better position to, to work uh, pedagogically. We just have to do the work on the, on the design side of things to, to get them to that point where they're able to kind of meet those needs. Well, um, I remember when I was younger, every once in a while, the, the teacher would go and put on a video or a movie or something, and it's like, great, now we don't have to do anything. And <laughs> it's just, uh, it's so, I, I, I mean, well, I mean, maybe games will get there. I, I, I Are you saying there's something wrong with that approach? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah <laughs> there goes my class for tomorrow night. <laughs> I would say that there's <laughs> something completely wrong with that. Absolutely, right? like, I agree. And, and part of this is related to so many people in game studies are game lovers and game players, right? And, and so there's a real sort of rose-tinted glasses look at the potential of games to change our lives, to make our lives better, to the gamification can save our world, you know, the sort of Jane McGonagall sort of argument. Uh, and yet we gloss over sort of like how poorly designed most educational games are, how ineffective they are, sort of how uh, compulsion and, and sort of uh, unhealthy habits are sort of really easily designed into these games. Like, I, th I think that that is a really, really big issue. And part of it is that gamification is seen to be the solution to an education system and teachers that are overburdened um, and students who have so many online resources at their fingertips that are engaging and interactive and, and you know at their laptop that it seemed like well just introduce games in the classroom and all of a sudden they'll start paying attention to you and you'll be able to do less work and, and they'll learn even more and they'll become coders and like I think that this is this is a problem with games based thinking right we think that we can win we just have to figure out the right solution. Well, and it, but it, we don't want to overlook the fact that education is already gamified. Through grades and evaluations and feedback, people are persuaded to adopt particular practices and behaviors that may not necessarily coincide with what they would have done, but that's how that system is designed. And students learn how to game it. That's, that's how mm -hmm. education works. Some people learn how to game it by cheating. Some people learn how to game it by um, finding out exactly what it is their teacher or prof is looking for and kind of pandering to that. Um, is that education? Is that really meeting our needs? Is that how we're preparing? Is that the best way we can prepare people to move forward? No, it's not, right? It's obviously got its own um, issues to it. And uh, ironically, I think that a game that can kind of um, condense that and rep represent it to people can show those inherent flaws in that system and maybe give us uh, 
cause to develop a, a better a better one moving forward. In defense of the TV cart, I will say <laughs> that I've learned the most memorable experience in science class was by watching Bill Nye the Science Guy. <laughs> so I think there's something to be said about the level of um, engagement that a, a finely crafted video can bring and and having a personality like Bill Nye who's very enthusiastic and, and still is. Uh, and again, I'll gesture towards the video essays because I think, again, we can hone in on that as a very um, memorable way to educate. Uh, and, and, and there's a, a, specific, a specific set of skill set that comes into making a video like that that a teacher may not be able to replicate in the classroom. So in defense of Bill Nye. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I think we have time for one more question. Yes. It's kind of halfway a gender question and halfway a medium question, I guess. Mm -hmm. I'm natively from English, and I've recently gone, th had opportunity to go through some of the numbers in our enrollment. And while they've been somewhat going down, but not precariously so, there is a huge split when you shift that over to gender that we've lost about. 50% are numbers in, ma in male students over the past seven years. Um, and anecdotally, at least, where most of that, talking to some colleagues, where most of that loss has happened is more on the literature side of the courses than the rhetoric and digital media. I'm wondering, is there, so, so when we talk about literacy, is there some level of zero-sum game between quote-unquote traditional literature and game literacy? Is, are there ways that we can work across these more traditional knowledge systems and the new ones? I got my own opinion, but I, I, f I thought that was a nice like, group question to... <laughs> to, to spend the rest of the afternoon with? <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, anyone? I think there's a certain feminization of literature and reading that's um, that the education system is kind of trying to deal with, encouraging more boys at a young age to read instead of do other things, um, such as play games probably. And we are encouraging more girls to play games and maybe instead of reading? I don't know. I don't think we need to encourage girls to read anymore. And I think there's something to be said about the courses we are now offering in English, which is the Harry Potter class and the Tolkien classes and all those sorts of things. But I think there's um, work to be done to enable girls and women to take what they're doing anyways now, which is playing games, and give them the tool sets to be able to talk about those. Uh, and I think that putting more games into, say, maybe a literature course it m might be a way to do that. Uh, I know for me, I took an English course that was a mixture of film and games and kind of stirring the pot with all those elements. And I found that to be um, very highly enrolled with women and um, a great way to kind of say, yes, you actually can do this. You don't need to be a gamer or like, whatever you know whatever that means uh, to be able to approach these kind of texts and so you know just even having that I think will change the dynamic of maybe instead of just like putting all the games into a coding class or um, like you know I'm trying to think of another example like design classes for example where where even the title of, of, of that course may uh, shy certain groups away from from even trying yeah, no, I think that um, there's a lot of overlap between like what, what games can offer literary studies as well. A lot of um, literary concepts um, and criticisms are, are criticisms of larger cultural and social systems and institutions. And maybe games are, are a way of helping us come to terms with that. And literature shows us the, the outcome of how those systems shape particular lives. Um, and even incorporating games into the study of literature. So you look at a, a game called To Be or Not To Be, which is a choose your own adventure adaptation of Hamlet, which s for a lot of people I find, I would imagine that Hamlet is pretty off-putting. It's, it's kind of, um, it's a very gendered story. It, it doesn't 
women don't take on a prominent role in it, and when they do, it's for very um, narrow reasons. I mean, what happens in To Be or Not To Be is you can actually choose not to play as Hamlet, but to play as Ophelia. And it's a completely different, it's obviously a made-up story, but I find it's a great kind of olive branch to people that don't want to necessarily rehash these kind of old um, Shakespearean time values, and but still want to engage with a literary work that is, uh, shows a mastery over the language and its ability to communicate. And so um, maybe there's a way of that they can work in concert with one another to, to um, make essentially what is the study of our culture more, more engaging for, for everybody and more inclusive for everybody as well. The other thing, Michael, I'm just wondering if we're getting into a kind of a, almost a watch what you wish for sort of um, era. And um, what I'm saying by that is that the push over the last decade, longer, but the push over the last decade has been towards non-arts education in the sense that government has been pushing for STEM education, nothing against it in any way, but the constant push towards, you know, this is what matters, this is what will get you your jobs, has meant mm -hmm. that increasingly, you know, parents and families are getting involved in pushing people into disciplines that are not arts-based. And I think we're trying, I don't know, I don't know what the difference, the gender issue there, or whatever there might be, but I, I wonder if this is going to be a cycle that the 50% loss of students is going to be certainly both genders, all genders, mm -hmm. not both gender, uh, and, and it's just gonna, it's a continual thing, and it may be that the change in educational focus for boys and young men over the years, and that's, that's something that educators are, are, are constantly worried about, by the way, uh, maybe we're starting to see some results that way. Or it's also part, maybe we just don't have many people. I don't, I'm not exactly sure how this all fits, but I, I don't think we've seen the end of that, to be honest. And I agree with Steve that we can do something about it. Uh, but uh, I don't know how it relates to literature, by the way, the study of literature, but it just could be, see, it's so devalued in society in so many ways that maybe this is what's happening. Yeah, I, I would agree. I would say it's also related to an intentional economy, right? Do you want to go read War and Peace, or do you want to go and sort of learn about Ophelia by playing a video game? And do you want to learn to make that video game? I think the cell to a generation that is perpetually anxious about where they're gonna end up after university, I think that immediately they would gravitate to, to a sort of education that incorporates games because they can see some sort of clear career for them in there. Whereas I think the line between you know, a pure sort of uh, literary scholarship I think that people are a little bit more sort of hesitant about that because most of our everyday liter liter literature sort of is like, well, are you going to be a blogger that's creating content for free? Um, so I think that that may be yeah. uh, related. But on that note, we went over time. I would like to thank you guys all for coming here in person and uh, for joining us on the live stream. Uh, once again, let's celebrate National uh, Digital Media Literacy Week and thank our partners, Media Smarts, uh, the Games Institute for hosting, uh, Dr. Steve Wilcox, Alexander Adla Orlando, and Neil Randall for uh, joining us in this panel today. And Jennifer Whitson. Yes. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. And some of us talk even after the formal thing, so uh, I'm sure we'll all be willing to yes, answer a few when questions. Yes, we are perpetually video recorded. Right.